right up on 1984, the year of George Orwell's famous book about Big Brother. And this movie explores in a very entertaining populist kind of way, Big Brother and the invasion of privacy. Everything I'm about to tell you is highly classified. Uh, you don't discuss it with anybody. Anybody who has 1984 Nightmares also has a fascination with the technology. We were both kind of hostile toward the idea of this helicopter. We knew that this was a, that, that the technical aspect of the film, the capability of the helicopter to really spy on people, uh, existed because we were doing it. Saturday Night Fever, and then for a complete change of pace, gone to England to do Dracula with Frank Langella. And while I was in England, uh, I got very interested in a play that was running there on the East End called Whose Life Is It Anyway? And managed to get MGM to buy the rights to it, and we got Richard Dreyfuss to star in it. So I had been working on that when Blue Thunder came along to me. In the, in the form of a script by Dan O'Bannon and Don Jacoby. This was just after Alien was made. And uh, Don and I had been friends since uh, film school. So we're sitting around and Alien's in the theaters and um, we talked about doing something together on spec. Now I was ill at the time, I was pretty ill. I'd come down with Crohn's disease. So uh, writing was difficult, but I had um, a a good advantage with Alien just having opened from my name. So Don and I agreed to do a script together on spec and that um, he would do most of the writing, but I would put my name first. And these were all for practical reasons. I recall uh, at the time we were talking, there was one of those very intrusive LAPD helicopters was going around overhead. And I remember we got to talking about a taxi driver. Say, hey, how about an LAPD helicopter pilot that goes crazy and shoots up the city? Don starts um, turning out pages, and uh, they were really magnificent. I mean, it, it, it went a, a good deal beyond you know, what we originally had in mind. When this came along, it was just great fun. And, and also, there was a serious theme underneath. Which I, which I thought was, uh, was very intriguing. The, all the characters in here who are involved in this huge kind of underground government conspiracy for various political purposes, I found very interesting as they're, they're grappling with this guy who's just there to you know, test a helicopter. They liked that third act with all of the helicopters shooting up LA, but they didn't like the rest of the uh, script because the main character, Murphy, was psychotic, and they didn't feel like spending top action movie budget with a, a crazy hero, it seemed to them, non-commercial. The character of Murphy is a kind of tragedy of the Vietnam War, you know, a character with post-traumatic stress syndrome, which was a term that was not thrown around very much at that time. But, you know, what do you do with these guys that we've trained to be, you know, murderers and killers and so on, all in the name of protecting America, but when you throw them back into the mix and what happens with that brain that's been scrambled in combat and so on. 
I think that he conceived of Murphy in a much darker way, a much more disturbed person than finally, eventually, eventually came out. And, um, and it was really borderline psychotic. Um, my, my feeling was that for the kind of movie that we wanted to make, we wanted to just bring him a little bit closer to us, not quite so, so far out. Once you make him sane, then in order, in order to justify his actions in the end requires a pretty complicated circuitous plot, which is what we ended up with. Turned it into more like your standard Watergate thriller, right? A sort of formless paranoia of big government out of which you can spit all kinds of half-explained scenes. Angeles Departure Control Air 12 out of 2000, VFR 5000 will be coming to you 122.5, traffic advisory. We went to the best source that we had, which was the Los Angeles Helicopter Division. And they were extremely helpful and cooperative. They were delighted that somebody was paying attention to them. And, and they understood it to be a fictional piece. So as long as we didn't call it the Los Angeles Helicopter Division, but something generic like the Metro Division or something like that, they were terrific. Police cooperation was, was very necessary to do a picture like this. And um, so it didn't take very long before we went through the script and, you know, obliterated stuff that they might get huffy about. They took us on helicopter rides at night with the pilots and the observers and we could see what's going on and a lot of the incidents uh, in the film, in the early part of the film especially, come right from those rides. We actually reversed the polarity on our, our prejudices and we made, we brought in some feds and made them evil feds and made good LEPD. I mean this is the road from ideological purity to all over the ideological map. And um, they were happy to cooperate. They thought it was great. Sir, Lieutenant Press wants you on the pad. The first time I heard about the film was through John Badham, who was in preparation to do it. And he, I don't know whether he called my agent or he called me first, but we arranged a meeting and we discussed the film. And then I, then I saw a script. Roy Scheider was always connected with this from from the get-go, and it wasn't very long after Jaws that he was, he was brought into this as the kind of movie star that was right for this, somebody that people liked. I played a lot of cops, but they were all different. I mean, there's a different cop in Jaws, there's a different cop in French Connection, there's a different cop in Blue Thunder. They come from a different uh, state, a different civilization, a different style. Somebody that was hot and young and uh, had, a, had a great vitality and energy and an intensity that Scheider brings to things. I mean, what I try to bring to anything that I do is, is some kind of sense of realism. I mean, I have to really believe that this could really happen. We decided that he was a, a, a kind of a maverick, a maverick guy, and uh, would certainly go off on his own and, and do certain things that uh, policemen weren't supposed to do, but. That film was made in a time when policemen who did things like that was, they were admired. Flying that new guy, uh, Lyman Good. That what? Me. Lyman Good. Outstanding. You wanted a character who is new to the helicopter business, who's coming in new, who's learning about it, and who has this kind of openness to everything. I had seen Danny Stern in, in Breaking Away and, and really loved his performance and that kind of big open-eyed innocence. From the moment we laid eyes on him, he started giving lines. I said, damn, I said, it is Lyman Goody. It was that way with a number of characters. I'm gonna have to get tough on you. Are you ready for that? I had remembered Candy Clark from American Graffiti, and I was delighted to, to find that, that she was going to be on this film. And had that just kind of wonderful, slightly ditzy, nutsy kind of thing about her. She brought that quality to the whole, the whole movie. 
You think I haven't heard about that silly twit out there in Encino? For Christ's sakes. I had 20 years in this outfit when your idea of a big time was sitting in front of the TV tube, watching Bugs Bunny, and gnawing on your fudgesicle. I had named him Bruddock, but before they started shooting, somebody figured out that it sounded like Buttock, and so they unfortunately changed him to Braddock. I've always been such a huge fan of, of Warren Oates. I mean, he's just the most wonderful quality of an actor who brings a personality unlike anybody else. He read lines that, that you and I could not read like that. He had, a, he had an, his own pronunciation, he had his own rhythm, and many a time, uh, I think I spoiled scenes by just laughing. Just laughing, he just cracked me up. He didn't change it, uh, he just made it his own and, and gave it, you know, his own kind of wry quality that, that he has. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what we wanted and that's what we got. Here, Jane, old cocksucker, isn't he? He passed away about a month after we finished shooting. And I think his heart just kind of gave out. Um, everybody was so in love with him and felt so bad about it that the, the movie is dedicated at the very end to Warren. It's an outstanding performance by Warren Oates. And um, Braddock, or Braddock, was originally semi-sympathetic, but uh, with Warren playing him, he uh, becomes even more sympathetic. Well, well, look who it is. Colonel Cochran, this is Captain Braddock of the Astro Division, and uh, Frank Murphy. Frank is going to do the actual testing over the city. Finally made Colonel, eh? If you're a nice guy, nice things happen to you. Now, the Malcolm McDowell character wasn't in the original draft because it didn't need a villain. But in order to, you know, have a functioning dynamic when you made Murphy good, Don sat down and dutifully invented the character of Cochran. I always liked to cast in slightly off-center ways, and I had a particular affection for an, uh, an Australian actor named Brian Brown. He had promised a friend of his that he would do a low-budget movie for them at the same time, and so he said, I, I just can't do it. And the next thing I came up with was Malcolm McDowell. When they cast Malcolm McDowell, and when he walked out there with that haircut and that jumpsuit, started talking. Well, Don, and my reaction was identical. I said, well, we didn't imagine him as English, but other than that, he's walked off of the page. There is that kind of nastiness to him that he does so well, so that he would be a great foil for, uh, for Murphy and have a you know, totally different kind of, kind of characterization and something that, uh, that we'd love to hate. Part of it is, is picking an actor who, in some sense, is what's on the page, and part of it is picking an actor who can, who's really good. Yeah, it was one of the pleasures of working on Blue Thunder. Catch you later. Philip Harrison, the production designer, and I decided early on we needed to extensively storyboard all the flight sequences, the helicopter sequences, and the action sequences. We didn't need to storyboard dialogue sequences because that's a waste of time. But to do it there uh, with the action sequences and the flight sequences is really good because then everybody knows what you're after. Because, um of the complexity of planning, you know, of where, if you've got helicopters and all this and you're shooting back down onto the ground, where do you put the unit? You know, where do you put, where do you hide stuff? All the, all the huge trucks and everything have got to be, well, further away than all, all that sort of thing had to be figured out. And the only way to do it was for me to provide um, a sort of totally laid out diagram of the entire film because basically we're going to be using so many natural, normal city locations in LA that you couldn't go too far away from this look of reality, you know. 
a sort of current, near future look, but not, not unrealistic. It's coherent as a design piece, you know, even though we stretched a bit with a helicopter. Usually you're drawing the storyboards before you know exactly what the location is. And often the location presents possibilities that you never thought of and interesting ideas. So, so you have to be totally prepared to take your storyboards and set them aside. But at least you've planned it out, you've thought it out in advance, you've got a game plan and you can vary from it. I basically tried to write something that was too difficult and expensive to shoot. I mean, the idea of actually doing helicopter combat over Los Angeles, I thought, was a fundamentally impractical possible idea. This was before, pre, before Top Gun, you know. And uh, once they actually bought the thing and went into pre-production, I was kind of gloating, looking forward to the incredible difficulty they were going to put themselves in. Well. Joke's on me, right? That was probably the easiest thing they did in that picture. Before I knew it, they were up there flying around fancy helicopters over downtown LA and popping off blanks at each other. Flying with Jim Gavin was a, a real treat because Jim would teach you while you're sitting in the seat next to him. And first thing you know, he'd, you'd have the stick in your hand and, and you'd be steering the helicopter and then he'd have you have the uh, the, the collective, which is the, basically the accelerator, and Roy got to the part where he could actually work the pedals, and that's what's steering the helicopter a lot. I had uh, been in the Air Force for three years. I had soloed in, uh, in Texas. I eventually washed out because I'm a lousy mathematician and I couldn't do the, the navigation. So I had some familiarity with uh, aircraft. The actual helicopter pilot was behind me and to the side. But when we took off or we came in, I had been playing with that, you know, the joystick a lot. So I, I was getting used to the feel of this thing. And sometimes they would let me land it and let me take it, take it off. But then once we got up, they said, no, no. They're all ex-Vietnam guys, you know, they're all hardened, sort of combat hardened. Um, pilots, you know, they're pretty hot stuff. I had the chance to look at the, the dailies occasionally, what was shot, and I would see shots of Malcolm sitting in the helicopter as well. And while the film was rolling, he would look very staunch and very mean looking. And then as soon as the director yelled cut, he would sort of go pale and you'd see his head go down like this. He would disappear out of the frame. And so one day I said to him, what's going on with you? What happens when you disappear out of frame? He says, I have to put my head between my legs because I'm so sick. His agent had made a deal with Columbia Pictures that he did not have to fly in the helicopter because he was terrified of flying. But he got to the set and he saw Roy Scheider getting in the helicopter. He saw, he saw Danny Stern getting in the helicopter. So he was embarrassed to say that he wouldn't. And, and he did it. And I'm certainly glad I didn't know. And it actually helped him get over a lot of his fear of flying, the, the work that we did in there, though it terrified him. I said, well, why did you take this part? He said, well, it's a great part, isn't it? so many people that are involved that you literally have to have a meeting with everybody there and say, okay, this is what we're doing today. You're going to fly the helicopter such and such a way. You're going to drive these cars and, and do this. Everybody has to understand what their job is in the overall picture and how it relates. And you can't rush it. John was the perfect guy to direct this movie. 
he really was excited about the relationship of these machines to, to people, to the ground, to the air. Uh, he really got, he really got it. The whole picture was exciting. Even the, the dialogue scenes had, were electric because there, there was so much going on behind the scene that was happening that uh, it, it, it almost was a wall-to-wall -wall action movie. I've always found that actors love to do that stuff. They just, ha it's so much fun. It's like, you know, being a kid again. And, and women just as much as men. I had to ride in the car with Candy while she's driving through uh, the bumps of the drive-in theater. And we're bouncing up and down and I'm in this car going, why was I such a fool as to get in this car with this person who's probably gonna run us into the wall or something like that. But she was top notch. <laughs> Invariably, there were six cameras photographing aerial action. And, and then they added stuff later with close-ups and guys flying them, you know. When we got to shooting the actors in the helicopter for close-ups for all of this very dangerous stuff at the end, that was where we came down to Columbia saying to us, do this stuff on the ground first. Make sure you have close-ups first. They won't be visually as good as what you want to get, but God forbid something happens. So we literally put the helicopter up on a six-foot platform and got everybody's close-up. And then we were allowed to you know, take them out uh, and do it in, in, in the actual streets. And the advantage of doing it in the actual streets is phenomenal because you start to get the reflections of the buildings passing on the bubble in front of them and you really feel that you're there. Things are streaking by you and it's so much more dynamic and alive. One uh, particular day I said, let's get a shot up in the helicopter of Roy flying it and the way we would do it is we'd put Roy Scheider on the right-hand seat and the actual pilot, Jim Gavin, would be in the left-hand seat and Frank Holgate, the second unit cameraman, would stand outside on the skids of the helicopter, strapped on with a little homemade uh, device that he made with clips and straps and all of this stuff, hooking right onto the helicopter. We take off and we get it lined up and Jim's flying it just the way Frank is saying, okay, here. And I look at Frank Holgate and he's standing there his skin is getting whiter and whiter and whiter, and this look of pure terror. What's happening is this whole rig, the straps are starting to come undone. And he was just going to drop off and fall back in, into the sky. And Jim already had seen him and was pulling the little window of the door open. And he reached out through it and wrapped his arm around uh, Holgate. So the next thing, there's this awkward thrusting of the camera back to me to get rid of the damn thing. And I thought, well, I got some footage here. So I put the camera up and I started to shoot, uh, you know, Roy actually flying the helicopter. We could now take our cameras out and do things that we hadn't been able to do before because the cameras were just too big, too heavy, too clunky. And uh, you, you couldn't have this kind of beginning of guerrilla filmmaking that now we sort of take for granted. John Lonzo is one of the most adventurous cameramen that anybody has, has ever seen. I mean, he came up as a poor kid from Mexico with nothing and not speaking English or anything like that and climbed to the very top of the, you know, the heap of cinematographers in the world. And he did it by taking great chances and having a boldness and a braveness with film and photography that other cameramen would not touch. John also was very good at handheld photography and he could walk around the actors. He could do things that we now use a Steadicam to do, only he could do it with much more grace than even with the, with the Steadicam. And he was very proud of that. It lets you get a kind of documentary feeling to it, faux documentary. We always wanted to have a shot 
that would you know, show this helicopter off to the best advantage. And after a lot of experimentation, we found that it looked the best when you shot it kind of head on and with a really long, long, long telescopic lens because that has the effect of kind of flattening it out and making it look more uh, frightening. It has tremendous power and, and, and I wish I had used it, you know, a couple of times more in the picture because it was so effective. There were a couple of things I just had to see. I mean, this was, for its time, a, a big action picture. And I was curious. I wanted to see the scene where um, the chickens come down on pedestrians in downtown LA. Everybody thinks that we used rubber chickens. Well, we didn't use rubber chickens. Rubber chickens cost $10 a piece. If you go to Ralph's and you pick up barbecued chickens, they're $2.50. We had these big cranes in there, 200-foot cranes, that had like hoppers in them. And when the trigger was pulled, these hoppers would open up and dump thousands of, of chickens down on, down on the ground for the key, the key moment. Our first and, and opening contact with the production was that chicken shack. And um, our, our need was to be able to put the sidewinder as it flies in and does a U-turn and goes down the, the stack of, the, of the, the restaurant. So our camera position was literally right across the street from this event. And again, we were very green. I was very young. I didn't know what was going on. I was just very excited to be there. And they had put us on the parallels again up in the air. Everybody's worried that this is going to happen too soon. So I'm the guy who's got this white flag that I'm supposed to wave so nobody can make the mistake but me. And we had our camera sitting there and um, they told us what was going to happen. They said that the van that's parked in front is going to flip through an explosive ram. You know, it's going to go up in the air. Uh, we're going to drop chickens, you know, blow chickens up. And we're going to blow the face off the facade of this restaurant, you know. And I didn't really grasp what that really meant and at the same time we're gonna fly this experimental you know helicopter with its blades literally feet away from you you know and it sounded very fun it sounded very exciting I give the signal for the explosion happens down on the ground of all the barbecue shack and the vans outside flipping over it literally melted the front of our mat box we have chickens flying everywhere they drop all over the place and the cars, you can actually see there's a Volkswagen and a police car and they're skidding through chicken fat. And we go out there because we have got to clean this all up before we go and suddenly homeless guys come out of everywhere and they're helping us with the, you know, clean up, clean up the chickens. <laughs> After that I went, oh my God, you know, we're crazy to be here. film had been trying to use real practical quarter-scale aircraft, F-16s and things, and it seemed to be not that practical at the end of the day. They crashed most of them and it was quite dangerous and just didn't turn out the way that John wanted. So they kind of looked toward the visual effects uh, process to, to kind of cure the problem. They came to us and said, could you do a test to show us that you could fly an F-16 convincingly through the daytime environment? And we said, well, sure, we'll try it. We had never done it before, but we would try it. And 1981, 1982, the state of the art of uh, special effects, visual special effects, was pretty primitive. Star Wars had helped advance the art quite a bit, and taking advantage of what's called motion control photography, uh, we were able to get this little fledgling company that was literally working in a garage in Culver City uh, were really good with special effects. We were a small shop and we didn't have access to like optical printing and we didn't have a model shop and things like that so we were working with associates and friends of ours that would build the different pieces and because it was a relatively simplistic request you know a simple F-16 there were available high quality models that were off the, off the shelf. They would take little model planes that were no bigger than this and set them on a stick against a black background and now shoot them with a camera that was moving and it would make the plane look like it was moving because against black all you saw was this shape coming toward us. We'd go out with cameras and we'd shoot you know what would be the background flying through and now we put this nice little plane lay it in there and the trick is to do it so you don't see all the edges. 
And I think to me in these kind of movies, that's very important that you kind of blend in and, and just help communicate the story. <laughs> was an 80 foot tall miniature, which is really not a miniature at that size, it's a maxature, but it was nonetheless the copy of the Arco Towers. The building had to be one-tenth size and the buildings were 700 feet tall. And you had to look like you were shooting up from the street, one of the shots, at a 700 foot tall building. So we finished the top 40 feet of the building and left the scaffolding on the lower half, which was out of the frame, because you were the unfinished part was where my hand is, and the available finished part was up here. And the idea was, as you saw in the movie, the helicopter flies by as the missile strikes, and there's a huge explosion blowing out the building as the Blue Thunder continues on through. Well, to facilitate that required the use of the RC helicopter. We had about eight cameras you know, in the Columbia lot, which is where we were shooting this, pointed toward the sky. One camera in particular was a close-up that was a shot which showed the helicopter squeaking through frame as the explosion was going off. One of the tricks of shooting miniatures, you have to shoot a lot of slow motion. And then that makes something really tiny look a lot bigger and grander than, than it really is. huge explosion, right, blows it up. But in the process of the explosion, we lose sight of the RC helicopter, completely engulfed in this explosion, right? We still hear it, but we don't see it, right? So the guy's like, what's going on right now? It flies over and, and crashes about maybe, I don't know, a quarter mile in a parking lot, just missing a Rolls Royce, you know, just barely by the hair of its teeth misses it. What we were proud of is that how many we did without model shots, how many we did with actual helicopters. So we blew up the Arco Towers with model helicopters and we did this loop with, with the model helicopter. RC helicopters through the years have been used before very effectively. I mean, they're completely convincing. Even today with computer graphics, the choice would probably be an RC helicopter because of, of with explosion, just the complexity that you get is very difficult to replicate in, in, you know, in com a computer environment. That's impossible. We wanted to tie full-size Murphy into full-size train. And it was easier to use a full-size train. That meant we had to build a full-size balsa wood helicopter. It was done to the exact configuration of the real one, the flying model. And uh, well, there was only one take. Take two would have been a few weeks down the line. And those things are only one take. And so it, uh, it took a good while to set it up. And it's got gasoline and all kinds of explosives in it. And the train company was willing to drive their train right through this, these explosives. They said, oh, no, it won't hurt it. <laughs> and you're, okay, okay, guys. We got this wonderful reaction from Scheider as he's doing it. Uh, I mean, he ducks down because it was bigger than, than any of us expected. So spectacular. You end up with a certain amount of your childhood being involved. You know, oh boy, we're going to crash a plane, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing. Uh, I just think that comes with the job and it's part of the, uh, of the peripheral benefits of the work we do. This film was so complicated that we actually had two editors on it. Frank Morris was the lead editor, and then his good friend and my good friend, Ed Abrams, was the second editor. When you shoot action film, you wind up with a lot of film. There's a ton of stuff to go through. I think uh, at the, in the neighborhood of 450,000 feet of film were shot for that, which is very economical, actually. Uh, uh, some directors would have shot well over a million feet of film. The choices are almost infinite of how to cut it together. And they worked in a, in a trailer for months and months and months. I mean, I thought it was never gonna end. 
The film dictates how you how you cut a movie. The film dictates the character of an actor. You can read one character into a into a piece and see somebody totally different than what you come up with. And it's the same thing with action. It wasn't a question of searching around to find something. It was search, the, the, the search was, you had so much good stuff, which one do you want to use? And how to make this story exciting, how to keep the people alive, make the people interesting is always a, is always a challenge. And then how to make this unbelievable action seem believable. The movie was almost two hours long to start with, and that's, a, that's long for this type of movie. If you get 500 people saying, I don't like this, then you, you, know, you can probably get rid of them. And so we pulled it down, tightened it up, and, and it's pretty exciting the way it is. Well, it's the scene where Candy ducks into an alley and shoots down the alley uh, only to be blocked by, a, I, I believe it was a car. She kind of runs her car up on some boxes and it puts it up on its side and she goes through with the car just teetering on two wheels and then flips back down flat and, and goes on. I think we were getting responses from our, from our audience that we had finally gone too far that this was not believable to them. Uh, even though we had ripped it off from a James Bond picture of uh, 10 or 15 years before. Yeah, I'm sure if it had been acceptable from a quality standpoint, they would have kept it in the picture. But it, uh, for some reason, it didn't work for uh, almost anybody who looked at the movie, well, anybody concerned about it. So it, uh, it, out it came. You know, the uh, review board wants to have you up for psychiatric reevaluation. Oh, come on. Well, what do you expect after your little wig out last month? The scene with the psychiatrist <clears throat> didn't work in the context of the movie because for some psychological reason, it slowed it down. It just stopped. Frank Murphy is sort of in Dutch all through the movie for attitude and actions, and they schedule him for a psychiatric examination. The scene was written with a rather hostile psychiatrist who was testing him and seeing what he was like. Ultimately, we felt the scene didn't add enough to the movie, which was a little bit long at the time, so we cut it out. But it was an interesting scene, and it was some kind of test of his reflexes and speed and, and things like that. It didn't seem to be a test of his psychological state of mind. When we ran the picture, again, the scene didn't work in the movie. and through a lot of agonizing. A couple of people wanted to keep it in. I think the writers, if I'm not mistaken. But for the sake of the movie, it, it came out. Fortunately, we were able to take it out. Oh my God, there she is. Those reactions are, are definitely for a nude lady. There's just no, uh, it, it wouldn't work. It does, it, I'm sure I've never seen that version. And I, 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 don't, I wouldn't even know who edited it, but uh, it uh, certainly would be flat <laughs> or unexciting, so, so to speak. We had uh, a two-piece bathing suit, I think, is what, what she was wearing. She redid everything that, that we shot uh, with her naked. She did it clothed, and that was just as a television version. Over in one of the corners uh, of that room is her boyfriend, probably with a gun to protect her. Uh, <laughs> As she, as she did, all of this, all of this yoga posing. She was a very flexible, flexible woman. What we're seeing of her naked is, is you know, is, is pretty mild uh, by today's standards. But even so, we knew that that was not going to pass muster for television. But the one that's the version that's in there is is very tastefully done. And uh, you don't you don't see anything that you shouldn't see a, a tiny bit of nudity really, nothing explicit or I mean no full frontal or anything. It's a, it's very it's a lovely scene actually. It's a, the girl was very pretty and very well built. Nobody knows what an editor does unless you've actually been in the room with him while he's editing, and yet he's one of the most creative parts of of a film. And without a good one. Without a good one, you are lost. What brings you to air support? Roy Scheider is Frank Murphy. 
a lone wolf. Freeze! Who's about to become a guinea pig. Columbia Pictures presents Blue Thunder. When it was released, the, uh, the critical response was mixed. Some people really liked it, they liked the action. Some people thought it was baloney. And uh, so we had, we had this mixed bag, but our audiences were really good and the audiences went for it and liked it. It was released improperly. It never got the proper release. I think it grossed about $50 million at that time. I was really impressed. I love the action, you know. I mean, in today's world, you think it's kind of almost far-fetched, you know, in some ways that a lot of these things that were kind of very science fiction are now actually come to pass, which is kind of eerie, you know. We often wondered how much of this technology was actually being used by the government or by any local agency to spy on people. And, and the same kind of uh, anxiety exists today. Right immediately after 9-11, I doubt if something like Blue Thunder would have been palatable to a lot of people. There was this constant pressure from above, make this a general audience movie. And uh, one of the decisions was that um, they were gonna blow up LA without hurting anybody. You know, when they tell you there's, a, there's an evil weapon, you always want to see it used. I doubt that they would have written it this way, let alone shot it this way. They probably would have made adjustments for it right after 9-11, but today I, I think it would be tame in, in today's world. The film has this wonderful build to it. You don't expect it to go as big as it does, but it keeps you entertained until you get to that point. And when it opens up, boy, that third act, I haven't been able to repeat that. The best sign that you're doing well is that people start to rip you off, and which is what happened with Airwolf. And Columbia ripped itself off with making a television series called Blue Thunder. You could make, you could make a Blue Thunder today, and the audience would be there to see it because the same problems about priv privacy exist. It's such a powerful image. It's such a, suggests such um, such a dominant, all-seeing, you know, presence. And I think that sort of is, is its little secret. It was so much fun to work with, and uh, it's always a ball working with John. And the reward was terrific. I mean, to get an Academy Award nomination is just insane. It's, it's, it's great. I sat down to write that thing being a, a, a cop hater, right? After the movie, so many LAPD came and said, boy, that was a great film, you know, that I was just forced to give it up. I couldn't hold on to being a, a cop hater under the changed circumstances. I thought that would be churlish of me. But you've got to have something you're mad about when you sit down to write. To do it for real was very, very hard, and, and it was totally exhausting. And by, by the end of the process, I was ready to get, just be carted off. But there is this you know, good, strong story with a, with a great score and good performances and wonderful action. So, uh, so I'm glad that I was able to you know, help hold it all together and, and, and make what we have. literally had to go and look at all kinds of existing helicopters and say which one would work. And so we became familiar with all the different models. I mean, all I knew about was the Bell helicopters that we see overhead here all the time. By the time we were looking at available helicopters to, you know, flying machines, which we could sort of adapt in some way, um, everything was sort of streamlined and roundy looking, you know, it was sort of not warlike at all. Our pilot, Jim Gavin, had said, I think the Alouette is the one that you want to use. And I looked at it and I went, I don't know, the lines are so sleek and I want something really masculine and, and uh, not quite so feminine looking. And it's a wonderful looking helicopter. But after looking at everything, and after our production designer, Philip Harrison, started attacking the drawings and adding things on, 
we realized that was the best answer. But we took an approach that was somewhat like we thought the military might take, the Army or the Army flies lots of helicopters or the Air Force, and saying, what would we want in terms of a machine that would do a lot of these kind of things? There, there was a, a fair amount of research and uh, a fair amount of extrapolating that research into our needs. You know, uh, Don Woodruff and I had to go down to uh, Carlsbad and measure the helicopter and draw scale drawings of it, you know, top, underside, side view, so forth, and then show what was to be removed and other things to be added. And of course it was impossible to have any, any uh, current um, military technology. They, you know, we couldn't get our hands on any of that stuff. Okay, these are your television monitors. You have three. The one in the center ties into all your computer banks. Switches. Night vision, infrared filter, target system, whisper mode so you can travel silent, audio which controls your outside mics which you hear. Everything that we hung on the helicopter had to be approved by the FAA and they would go down to Costa Mesa where we were doing this work and watch and see every single thing had to be approved but it added a lot of weight and helicopters don't like a lot of weight. This thing is nose heavier than the Ayatollah. I think they added a couple hundred pounds to the plane. The, the gross weight that it could lift was about 1,200 pounds. So what we had was a big clumsy beast that didn't maneuver very well and, and was just kind of hard. So the poor Alouette helicopter was just struggling under all this extra weight we put on it. And, you know, we did all sorts of things, like we stuck lights all over the helicopter, which you would never know, you'd never notice them. Because there were a lot of night shots of it flying over the city, and of course it's very difficult, because normally it'd just be a silhouette with a couple of uh, anti-collision lights, you know, flashing here and there. But um, in fact, he put some little tiny lights to just wash a little bit of light onto the structure of the plane itself. So it sort of started adding up pretty quick. All right, here goes the whisper mode. Whisper mode. Can you listen outside a building from the vibrations you're picking up on the window? We kept thinking about this, and we say, well, the helicopters are very noisy. Can't, how quiet can you make them? Can you get them really quiet into a way that you can get close to a building and not have it blow you away? Because you can hear those things coming from the longest distance. You know, the faceting rather than the rounding. You know, they have to use armoured glass or some very bulletproof glass, if that's the right expression. And it doesn't curve very well. Compound curves are not on, you know. So it all has to be slabs of glass. So you, you make a faceted deal. And that gives it a sort of insect-like, scaly look. It had to have certain slants so that it didn't bounce into camera. And, you know, given the parameters, you sort of design inside those parameters. So we started totting off a list of a, a Gatling gun kind of machine, machine gun that can, be, that can be aimed simply by having in your helmet a heads-up display. So if you look this way, the gun would go this way. If you look this way, it would go this way, up, down. So you can aim it just with your head. But, you know, the, the dummy plane, the second backup, that if they were using long shots and didn't have to show screens on the control panels and all that kind of stuff, the guns were broomstick handles, literally broomstick handles. But they had the other one that fired a settling shots that were fired, and you could see it go... One thing I do remember is that in meetings with various uh, defense contractors, a couple of companies, offered to provide us with 50 million live rounds of ammunition, as much as we wanted. And I said, wait a minute, you're going to give us live rounds of ammunition that we're going to be firing around? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, it'll be fine. I said, uh-uh, no, you're not. <laughs> we're not going out there with live, we can barely deal with special effects. We're not, we're not gonna be shooting around extras and stuff like that. We knew enough to build two helicopters so that if one shut down on us, at least we had, we had a spare. And 
movie props, which is what this was, is a big movie prop. They just have a way of breaking down. They just won't behave on the, the day you need it. So you, you, you learn pretty quickly. <laughs> Back yourself up. By the time we, the design, I think we made models of it and everything. The reason we knew it would all work, um, apart from having been told that by the flying guys that it would work, was that we did um, quite a number of shots with the radio control models of the thing. So we knew exactly what it was going to look like. These things were made, you know, and finished and flying, I think, before the actual one. And um, the other thing, of course, was that even before that, it had been drawn and, and sort of art department models had been made of it, too. So we'd studied it, and everybody had studied it. Everybody who's had anything to do with it knew what was coming. It was deadly serious, you know, to get something like this done, you know, you're very much, uh, Christ, you know, it's, this, has got to, this has got to work. It sort of came together in that regard uh, from the cold statistics of a working drawing to fleshing it out, you know. It's all based on reality and you do as much reality as you can, but the bottom line is you've got to satisfy the requirements of the script.